Okay, um, welcome to the show and uh, glad to see some familiar faces here already. Now, uh, we've got quite an ambitious little taster for you to start with, and that's what my opening comments are. They're only a taster. It's just to uh, get, the, get some thoughts flowing and invite the, uh, the endless possibility of creativity to, to surface and, and we, uh, we deal with what comes up. But I've done a bit, little bit of preparation thinking and I have to say when I first sent out the invitations I hadn't thought at that stage what we we're going to talk about. But then um, somebody came to my rescue and it was uh, Laura, not the first time she's uh, come to my rescue, and she sent me an article about the shadow according to Carl Jung. So she knew I'd be interested in that. And um, so I quickly read this article and I got very interested indeed. And that's what we're going to open with. And uh, for once, I've got two subjects um, up my short sleeves. And the second one is the Milgram experiment. And you might think, well, there's no connection between the two. But I'm going to make a case that uh, there's a very strong connection. And it could even be that they're one and the same thing. So uh, onto the shadow. Now, we all know, and I guess it started, the first reference that I've found to this is Plato. He said, the secret really um, is, to, uh, is you have to know yourself. And particularly if you're going to be any kind of a coach or, or you want to raise your own game to the next level. I, I'm convinced, inc I become increasingly convinced of the importance of knowing yourself. So uh, Plato said that, and I know Nietzsche said something differently, and I'm quite sure that many other philosophers and people have said the same thing. So this is another example of, uh, it's, it's not rocket science. But having said that, um, it's not easy. Because to know yourself, it's no good taking this on a sort of a, a superficial view. You know, I like the way I look, I like the way I talk, I, I think I'm a good person, I do good things. It has to go much deeper than that. And that can be very uh, painful without, in fact, it, it, it almost is, in fact, it certainly will be painful. And uh, you don't really know how painful it'll be until you get into the kind of mindset that you can look deeper into yourself. And um, it's certainly something that I've done. And uh, I guess it was an experience that was forced upon me or, or and as I started, be, you know, becoming, developing a passion for being a mind coach and understanding how the mind worked. I don't think there was any other way around it. And um, looking back at it, although some parts were really painful, the overall benefit is very, very clear. So uh, this is a kind of a health warning. If you go down that road, don't expect it to be an easy road. But my experience, at least, is that you come out the other end stronger and, and well, I wouldn't say wiser, but, but certainly a deeper level of understanding of what kind of person you are. And the stuff that kind of surfaces is what Jung would have called the shadow. He said that uh, inside our mind, and in my words now, inside that reptile brain that I talk about, the deepest, most primitive part of our mind, there is where this shadow lurks. And um, the shadow has some pretty uh, unpleasant, I was going to say thoughts, but because it's in the reptile brain, it doesn't think in terms of words. So I can't use the word like thoughts, unless I say there are aimless sort of feelings and there's firing off of certain neurons. But very, but very, very often the shadow is, um, uh, is, uh, is, is focused on your past, my past, and particularly the things that haven't worked out well. Uh, in fact, almost universally, the things haven't worked out well. It's very rare in my experience, at least, that an examination of the shadow will come up with some good stuff. I don't think it works like that. Now, we are apparently civilized human beings. And we have a, a personal code of behavior, which is our guiding moral compass. And almost all of us, in fact, probably all of us have that. Uh, but in some it's stronger and in others it's not so strong. And to help us, we 
belong in, to tribes. We belong to family units, and we belong to the area where we live, and we belong to a country. And the country that we belong to will will set rules because if we don't have uh, you know uh, have adopted these rules, the country will do it for us. And depending on the severity of our offences against the so-called rules, though, so the punishment will differ. Now, this, of course, is, uh, puts the, uh, the conscious mind, which is the code of behavior type stuff, into direct conflict with the shadow. Because the shadow is what I call the, the reptile brain, and, and by the way, over the last few days, I've been, in, been reading more than just this one article. And um, so far, I haven't found anything that contradicts what I refer to very, very often as the reptile brain. Uh, so I think this is the word that Jung used, the shadow, and I think that's a great word because it is a shadow personality or an alter ego perhaps, uh, but reptile brain just works for me because I've said before that I think the majority, if not all of our thoughts come from the reptile brain and um, some of them don't get very far up the levels of consciousness and some do and the ones that do are um, I could say sanitized they, they're made to, they're made to uh, appear to ourselves and particularly to others to be more rational we want to do this because we want to get that or to help this happen and um, because the reptile brain is primitive the kind of primitive thoughts and feelings that surface from there are going to be pretty ugly. Generally speaking, they're going to focus a lot on what I want, what the individual person wants. And uh, the very common one is the green eye. You look around and you see something that somebody else has got and you think, I want it. And then you'll kind of do a half justification. That person doesn't appreciate it. I would use that more if I had it. So then we think, how can we get it? Could be anything. Could be a, that person's partner. It could be one of their possessions. Might be one of their family. Frankly, I think my family is big enough already. I can't imagine wanting any more, but anyway. Uh, that, that's, those are just the kind of things. It might be the job. It might be, why has that person got more success than me? Why has that person got a better job than I've got? bigger car than I've got, bigger house than I've got. The list goes on and on and on. And um, sadly, uh, that list, if you allow it, will, will always go on because you'll never be satisfied. And I guess we all know people like that. The people who tend to be satisfied is they've tamed their reptile, the art of training lizards. They've tamed their reptile and they know what they want. And when they get what they want, that's it. That's what's called contentment, satisfaction. And then they're happy. But the people who are always wanting the next thing are never happy because they never get there. So getting back more to the kind of things that Jung said, he said that uh, there will be times when we examine our past and we will say, how could I, how could I have done such a crazy thing? How could I have been so thoughtless? How could I have been such an idiot? Well, I think all of us will have had those thoughts and some, some of us more, more than others. But the fact is we did do those things. And at that time, that felt like the right thing to do. If it felt like the wrong thing to do, we wouldn't have done it, but we did. So it's only with the benefit of hindsight that you can look back and you can recognize that that another word for that is is learning and it's hard learning there isn't a single human being yet that i know of or heard about in any way that's perfect so if a person's looking for perfection they ain't going to find it and as people have said you know you can't change the past but you can change the way you think about it and when you start to dredge some of this stuff up, shining a light on it, the good news is, is that a lot of the negativity surrounded with it just 
like evaporates. It will never go completely, of course, because what you did do in the past, what I did do in the past was very stupid and nothing will change that. But one gets a bit of perspective about it. And um, I, I, got a, I, got, I wrote one quote down from, from Jung and I'm gonna to have to read this, I haven't memorized it. But he says, um, everyone carries a shadow. Yeah, I could believe in that. Everybody has a reptile brain. And the less it is embodied in the individual's in the individual's conscious life, the less it's embodied in the individual's conscious life, the blacker and denser it is. So he is saying, you know, have the courage, have the resilience to be able to look deep and, and then deal with it, recognizing that a lot of it will deal with itself. Now, what I that quote from Jung. Uh, we're not taught to write like that anymore, or certainly, you know, the training that I've been through, because it's all about the negatives. The less it's embodied, the blacker and denser it is. So I've been taught how to reframe stuff. So how, how I would reframe that, and I'm not suggesting that in any way that that would be better than what Jung wrote, but it would be everyone carries a shadow. Yeah. And the more that this is embodied in the individual's conscious life, the, uh, the, uh, the purer and uh, denser, purer, opposite of that, I can't think of that offhand. But anyway, shining a light on it, you're turning something that's negative, which is the shadow into something positive. And shining a light on it is probably a good metaphor because what happens if you're standing on a street and you know, in the street behind light, you're casting a long shadow, but if you put a torch on your face, the shadow goes. So that's a very, very superficial look at, uh, at the shadow self. But the, the one thing that's clear is that before you can start to understand other people, you have to understand yourself. And if you're going into the coaching game, as many, many people do, and you haven't made any effort to, to, to go deep, then I'm afraid that's going to take away from your coaching experience. And, um, and, and, your, and your credibility. Now, moving on, when actually, I'll just take a, a, a breath there before I move on. So this is one of these uh, times when you can ask a question or make a comment. So I'm gonna stay silent and see who sticks their hand up. Nadia, the early comment and the first comment I had in my mind when you were talking about, when you started talking about it was that People are afraid of, 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 of getting on that path of development of themselves when they realize that they have to go deep into the darkness of themselves, when they need to get to know themselves really deeply, when they need to get to know the, the shadow part. And that kind of puts them away as if they were afraid of getting to know, even though they know it. Because we all know what the shadow part is, really. You might just be taking that thought away from us, consciously or unconsciously, but we all know what that is. Um, so that was my comment. And when you were talking also about, you know, coaching stuff, I started coaching people as well. And um, it's kind of fun for me when, when I observe myself and my shadow part, trying to be aware of the thoughts I have when I'm in social situations and some weird thought comes to my mind um yeah it's just fun being aware that the shadow part exists within you and what that is and observing that and and accepting it that's the thing i think it, it helps and i think that acceptance is that putting the light on it at least within yourself and then you know when you share that with someone else i think that would help even more yeah well, thank, thanks for coming in th uh, there, Greg, and, and I, I agree with you, and uh, listening to you gave me an opportunity to reflect on what I've just been speaking as well, and you, you're quite right, it's, it's a painful journey, and um, I, I found that it's like an onion skin, that um, one can fairly quickly have a, a shallow dive in, into the unconscious mind and into the shadow, but uh, once you start to assimilate that, um, it seems like there's an automatic process if you allow it to continue where you go deeper and deeper and, and sooner or later uh, you're going to get 
deep where you get a reaction there'll be a physical reaction and uh, in, in this kind of work we call this an ab reaction very emotionally charged reaction and um you know some of the courses that i've i've been on uh as a trainer uh i, I was always puzzled why the delegates around about day three would be highly emotional about some stuff it wasn't day two it wasn't even day four it was day three and one of the people who'd been hold, been a trainer for longer than me i, I mentioned it to them and they said ah oh, you've noticed we call that weepy wednesday and it, it's always on day three. And that was just the, like the pace of the learning and the insight that, that it hit them more or less. And um, there, was a, there was a day, you know, when it hit me, actually it wasn't a day, it was the night. Uh, and, and I just, uh, I woke up at four o'clock in the morning, the most distraught uh, I, I've ever been, for as long as I can remember anyway, with the most vivid images of some of the stuff that I'd been exposed to in the past. When, when I was working in war zones and stuff, the things that I'd seen. And um, they, they, you know, they, they, came, they, they came out and I can still remember them. Those memories haven't gone, um, uh, but they don't carry the, uh, uh, they're not as black and dense as, as Jung would have said. So it, so it does work. Now, many people won't be ready for that and, and, and I, don't, I don't recommend it either. But there is a very relatively painless introduction to, to looking a little deeper, and that's to look in the mirror. Because if, when you catch yourself saying something very judgmental about another person, and that's a very easy thing to do now, because any opinion that we have about anything under the sun, there's a, there's a polarity across the world. There's, there's more polarity and, than ever before and less singularity. So there'll be people we don't like because we can come up with lists of reasons why we don't like that person and they will do the same about us. But I can't remember who said this, but I think several people said it. Look in the mirror because the kind of things that irritate you are the things that are in your shadow and it's your shadow that is surfacing. So that's one to bear in mind. And, um, and certainly, you know, I've caught myself in the mirror and I thought, you know, Steve, get off your high horse. You know, this is reptile brain and, uh, you know, you're no different. So uh, anyway, that was that was a comment that was prompted by Greg. So as I've always said, you know, uh, to hear another voice is always good. And a question is always better than an answer because it opens up the realm of infinite possibility. Uh, any other questions or do we move on now? Okay, well, uh, if you're studying a psychology degree, which, which I haven't done, but I've certainly read plenty of psychology, one of the first things you read about was the Milgram experiment. And I've known about it for, um, you know, quite a long time. And, and it is pretty stunning the way it was described to me, but I've actually read more about it just this morning, because I wanted to have some fresh thoughts for tonight. And I'm, I'm just blown away, really. So I'm, this is only a taster, so I'm, I'm going to you know, gloss over a lot of stuff. But um, fundamentally, the Milgram experiment was uh, conducted by this chap called Milgram at Yale University. And I think it was in the 60s. So it's been around a long time. And there were three people involved in the study. One of them was called the, um, the experimenter, who was in charge of the, uh, the knobs and the dials and the process. And one person was called the teacher. And in fact, the teacher didn't know it, but the teacher was really the subject of this experiment. And the third person um, was called the, uh, the learner. So we had a teacher, a learner, and somebody in charge of the buttons. Now what? Um, the learner and the uh, teacher didn't know is that it was supposed to be random, but it wasn't because the learner was always an actor for reasons that will become apparent. And the, the instru instructions from the experimenter, the person in charge to the teacher was, we're teaching this person words and we're experimenting whether to, whether to see that if we give a slight electric shock to somebody when they make a mistake, then um, it will improve their learning. 
And that's maybe not very pleasant, but it's perfectly plausible. I mean, I, I know that people use little electric shocks for training dogs and cats and stuff like that. And they use electric shocks on fences to stop the horses reaching over the, the, he the hedge and stuff. So, you know, I, I personally wouldn't do that to anybody, but it, it was plausible. And uh, sure enough, the experiment started and the learner would make a mistake, mistake and the experiment would say, well, we have to start with the small shock. I think it was 15 millivolts, but I might have got that number wrong. And so um, the, the teacher would press the button and there would be a realistic buzz because the learner was in a separate room. The teacher couldn't see him. And, um, and, and so hopefully the learner had learnt. Well, sure enough, as the experiment went on, the learner made another mistake and he got another shock and he carried on making mistakes. And then the experimenter said, we have to turn up the voltage because we think that if there's a, you know, a higher voltage, a bit more of a shock, a bit more pain, it will help this person to focus and become a better learner. Well, this is where all of us now would start to get very uncomfortable indeed. Well, it didn't stop there. They got up to levels of um, electric shocks that would have been fatal in many cases. And this came as a huge surprise. Now, of course, the reason why there was an actor is because these weren't shocks at all. It was dummy. The, the, the guy would press the button and it would sound like he was shocking the guy in the next room, but he wasn't. But the actor was acting and at times would be screaming and, and begging for the person to stop. And there'll be times when the teacher would look around to the experiment and say, look, you know, do we carry, do we carry on with this? Say, oh yes, it's in the protocol. We have to carry on, you know, even if you're not. And 63%, yeah, I've written that down, 65%, 65 of the teachers were prepared to administer a fatal shock. Now that was a shock to the researchers because even then, you know, it's a long time ago, but there was, uh, there were ethical guidelines to experiments and stuff. And this person had spoken to professors and all the rest of it. And they said, yes, in a random cross section of people, you will get a few people who will do whatever you want them to do. They will, we expect that to happen. But nobody ever said that it'd be anything approaching 65%. Now that's a staggering finding. And this experiment has been replicated many times across the world and the results have all been largely the same. So what does that mean? Well, people have, it's not for me to say, what does it mean? But people have extrapolated this because at the same time the experiment was done roughly, there was Adolf Eichmann, who was a Nazi war criminal, was being tried. And they were saying, well, you know, perhaps this explains the Holocaust, that if you just give, I mean, they, because the defense of these war criminals and then and now, I mean, we don't have to go back to the Second World War, but people said, now, I was a soldier, I was under orders, as if that kind of clears you of any moral rectitude. So this debate goes on and on. Now, what does this have to do with the milgramic, what, with, the, with the shadow? Well, I think they're the same things. We've got the reptile brain, and in the right circumstances, the reptile brain will carry out pretty primitive acts with very little empathy, let alone compassion, for the person who takes the pain. So we've talked about free will before and how free will may, may be a lot less, uh, uh, may be a lot more elusive than we believe it to be. Um, so what is the cure? Is there a cure? Well, I don't, I'm not sure that there is a cure, but what Jung said, you know, in that quote that I gave you, um, if you, if you can engage a little bit with your, uh, with your shadow, then you can shine a little bit of light. And if we've got enough people shining a little, little bit of light, we start to light up a village or a town. I mean, it's the usual thing, do one thing at a time. So I thought you'd find that interesting. And, and my thanks to Laura for certainly getting me on this path this week. That's kept me quite busy thinking about this one. I haven't drawn many conclusions. I'm not sure that I even want to. Anyway, time for me to take a breather. What do we think about that? I think I watched something similar to the milligram experiment um, and it was Darren Brown, the mentalist. Mm -hmm. He conducted such an experiment. Like actually he, he, he um, captured that, I mean, he filmed it, created a story, a scenario where he, uh, and it was a very twisted scenario and he involved people in. 
in that and so so people if they wanted to get out of this scenario with with clear hands they were ready to kill other people basically so so yeah so, so that, that's my comment it was struggling to watch that the just for pretty much a silly thing people were really ready and they've done it they were not just ready in their minds they've done it obviously they were actors on the other side but they were ready to push the person off the roof to kill them to stay safe. So, yeah, yeah I, can be I can believe that. That's that's very typical of Darren Brown. He, you know, to present that kind of program. I mean, he would start from the research and then, you know, put it into his own way. And and the findings don't surprise me. D D Darren Brown, I know, has had similar training to me and been trained by the same people. So you, I, even though I've never met him, I, I can be pretty certain that that he would have been on the same exploration that I mentioned earlier about uh, into the shadow. And 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 this is all about um, about obedience, and that's what Milgram said. And he actually made a film which was based on his research called Obedience. And it you know there's some clearly something in our genes that make us follow orders, all of us. Uh, even if they appear to be quite stupid, I mean, as long you know, we'll go along with so much without saying anything. And of course, uh, um, you know, in in uh, in dictatorial regimes, that kind of freedom of thought is not allowed, and uh, there are heavy, including fatal consequences for being a free thinker in some countries. So we're, we're at least we're lucky in the West where we have more freedom than a lot of people but we still have to follow rules. Well, do we have to? We're expected, we're expected to follow the rules. And, and most of the times I'm sure we do. Okay, well, um, I'm perfectly o uh, open to changing the subject completely now. If any, uh, uh, if any of you have had any insights during the week or you've been on your explorations and found anything interesting you want to share with the group, I think we're all regulars on this show now. I haven't seen the complete list, but the last time I checked. So, I, and I think we touched it last week or two weeks ago about forgiveness. And that Einstein, I, I think it was Einstein, faced with that question, so should we forgive uh, murderers? I was thinking about it, I was even talking with someone today about it, about that forgiveness, and, and can it be really achieved, and, and that this is really the highest level of spiritual development, if you can forgive a murderer who murdered someone from your family, for example. So, so I think that forgiveness can come if it's possible to achieve knowing that that person has done it because of its shadow part, I suppose. Knowing that it was not really him doing the murder, it was his ego. It's not his ego, only it's actually shadow part, the reptile brain. Should we forgive in such cases? Well, um, I, I know that some people do because uh, we, we see them on the news. Uh, and if I just look at it from a det detached academic viewpoint, then I'd agree with that point, that this person did what they thought was right at the time. I mean, the, 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 the prisons are full of people like that, um, including murdering other people. And actually, I've, I've worked with murderers, not, not in prison, but uh, in, in a psychiatric uh, community. And uh, unless you knew the records, you would never guess. You'd never guess. There were, there were tragic souls, some of them. So they might have had one act of absolute lunacy in their whole life, and they spent the rest of their life regretting it. I mean, the, 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 I can still remember the kind of the common room where all the, the residents, the inmates, they would have their group meetings, and that's where they would relax in the evenings into the TV sets and stuff. And the first thing I noticed was the perimeter of this room. It was a very big room. The carpet was worn bare because these people, or some of them, would just be walking round and round and round and round and round. It was um, barbaric. Um, so, yeah, I mean, personally, 
if could could I forgive somebody? I think right now I'd say I couldn't. I know I know that it would be great to, but I'd have to say I couldn't. But you can never predict what you're going to do until it happens. How to? Then, uh, Oh, sorry, go on. Oh, sorry, I was just going to finish. I just had a thought and I'd lost it. But um, when, when, you see, when everything's going well, this, this ego, this moral compass or whatever, is, is, is definitely in charge. But when you start putting pressure on a person, that's when you start to see... Uh, to see this thin veneer of civilization rub off. And that is something that I've had direct experience of because I've seen it and I've seen what, what happens. And uh, it'd be wonderful to think, well, you know, it wouldn't matter how much pressure I was put under, I would never do something like that. Well, I certainly hope that's true, but you never know until you're under that kind of pressure. Anyway, Greg, I interrupted you, sorry. Yeah. Um... What can you do to achieve that forgiveness for someone if that person has done some really bad stuff to you and, and, and at the moment you, 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 you can't forgive, you just don't feel it like, like, you, like you want to do it, but you know that forgiveness is the answer, the final answer, and, and, and you know that forgiveness it's actually not for the other person, it's for yourself. It's to heal yourself from within, but of the, the negativity that the other person created in you. What can you do to achieve that? Knowing that you want to, that you should forgive, but you don't feel it like you want to, but you want to get there, how to get there? I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, uh, I wouldn't know where to start. Um, other than to say, there's another type of forgiveness that's important and which is in more of our control. And that's the bit that's very easy to forget. And, and it's really important. And I know this from working with people. And that's to forgive yourself. It might not be possible to forgive other people, but there are ways to forgive yourself, at least to some extent. Stop beating yourself up is what I would talk to people. Now, of course, they're not talking about people they've murdered or anything like that. But to them, it seems big. It's easy for me looking on it. It doesn't seem that big to me. But it's, if somebody's carried this all their life, I say, really, it is time to stop beating yourself up. Now, me saying that doesn't make any difference. So I have to take them into a quiet place in their mind where we can start to, you know, uh, let things go a little, shall we say. I can't see anyone okay. raising hands. Okay. Well, um, I guess I should apologize that it's been a bit of a gloomy subject tonight, but I've tried to inject uh, some hope as well. I mean, we have to be realistic about the world we live in, and um, there is always hope, and we've uh, <clears throat> pointed a little bit in some directions where we might find that. So th thank you for, for uh, watching and for joining, joining us today. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please do subscribe to my channel and then you'll get automatic updates of, uh, of anything that I do. Uh, I'll take this opportunity of reminding you my podcast. It comes out every Thursday in Europe time and um, it's called The Zen Doctor. So if you look on uh, the usual places, Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, Amazon, you'll find it. It's, only, it's about an eight minute brief dive into the Zen mind state. And the numbers are building up almost like exponentially. We started off very slow, but we're starting to get a bit of traction now. And it's, it's fun to do. Uh, the, what's on the menu next week? I'm not sure at this point. Uh, I welcome suggestions. Um, I've had a couple already that I'm still thinking about them. One of them was to talk about bioresonance. I get a lot of hits on some of the videos I've done about bioresonance, and I'm, I'm not a you know, I don't push bioresonance. I'm not a huge fan of bioresonance therapy, but, but I do think there's something there. And the other one was the Kabbalah. Now, I've tried to uh, research the Kabbalah and, and I found it incomprehensible. So I'm looking for somebody who can explain Kabbalah in about five minutes. And if they can, they're on the show next week. Okay, in, in the meantime, 
Um, have a great week. <clears throat> be kind to yourself. And if possible, be kind to at least one other person too. Okay, bye. <laughs>